when Denea pulled up this morning, the door wouldn't shut on the van, and uh, the electrical thing wasn't charging, it said check charging system, and the battery died and went kaput right there as she was <laughs> sitting there trying to get the door closed. Before that, I spent all morning fighting the printer because the internet was out this morning, and so had to reset the printer up. Been fighting a, a cold during the week, finally getting over it, but still have the, the, the lingering vestiges of that. And to that I say, welcome to the battlefield. Uh, when Brad and them pulled up, he said, what's going on? I said, chaos. Problem is that 50% of it's up here. <laughs> then the devil adds all that other mess to it. And so... When I have mornings like this, I ask somebody else to pray for me, and so, uh, Tyler, would you mind doing that? Amen. Isaiah 14, 12 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. That text has been understood for a long time to speak of the devil, but uh, we'll look at that in a little bit. But where comes the devil? The problem of evil, including its origin and persistence, has perplexed scholars, laymen, intellectuals, mechanics. I used to work with a mechanic that uh, really was quite the philosopher. Uh, housewives, philosophers, and anyone else who has ever taken just a moment to think about the problem of evil. In the beginning of this study of the doctrine of Satan, Dwight Pentecost, or his study, Dwight Pentecost says, where did Satan come from? Did God create the devil? Is God responsible for evil? Such questions plague the individual who wrestles with the existence of our adversary in the light of the Bible's revelation of the holiness of God. Philosophy can never give a satisfactory answer to these questions. The only satisfying answer is God's answer found in His Word. And it's to that we will turn. Last week, we introduced this series by taking a snapshot of the ongoing war against heaven as depicted in Revelation 12. And there we saw that the combatants were led by the dragon, also known as Satan and the devil. But if Yahweh alone is God, if, he, if there is no other God, then where did this dragon, this adversary of God, come from? And that's going to be the topic of our study today. And the first thing we're going to look at is the identity of the dragon. Revelation 12, 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, <clears throat> who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, notice that the dragon is that serpent of old. Now, that's pretty clear, then, a reference to what? The serpent in the garden, right? And notice that it's the serpent that deceived Eve. Well, he continues his mission in, our, in, in Revelation 12, 9 of deception, and he's the one who deceives the whole world. So to understand who the dragon is, we need to understand who the serpent is. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we see there that the serpent was in the garden and that he deceived Eve. He lied to Eve. He slandered God. But who is this serpent? It doesn't really tell us who he is. Or, you know, why is there this crazy snake in the garden that could talk? We don't, we don't get much, much information. It's just all of a sudden there doing its evil deed. But he is a serpent that slanders and deceives. So we get some connection there because in our, in our uh, text in Revelation 12, 9, he's termed the devil and Satan. Well, the term devil means slanderer. And the term Satan, which comes straight over from the Hebrew, really means adversary. Now, we see this one called the adversary in David's sin of numbering Israel. Remember when David got in trouble for doing a census for the army? In 1 Chronicles 21, 1, it says, Now Satan, or now adversary, stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, why should we take this reference to uh, an adversary as being the dragon. Why not God himself? Because in, in the parallel passage in 2 Samuel 24, 1, it says that God moved David to do the census. So the term can simply mean adversary and is used of God elsewhere. In Numbers twenty two thirty two, 32, in the story of Balaam and Balak, it says, And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. And that, that word there is that I have come out against you as an adversary, as a Satan. And so uh, God can be an adversary. So why then would we take this passage to be the, uh, that Satan is the adversary over there in First Chronicles? Well, the reason why we seem that we do that is because this is the first time that the word appears without the definite article to be the, the, the uh, adversary. And so it seems to function as a proper noun. Uh, and, and it seems to be that the, that the devil, the, the serpent, is involved. We'll, we'll see this a little bit better if we consider the book of Job. Remember, there's an adversary in the book of Job. Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 11. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. See, he is the adversary in this text, the Satan. And so there is an individual in this story that is the adversary of God and of Job. And it's clear that this adversary is a particular angel, because the angels come before the, the, uh, the sons of God in this reference, and it's a reference to the angels, uh, come before the Lord and uh, present themselves. And this particular angel opposes God and opposes Job. Uh, and he's been going about the earth, and what's he do when he goes about the earth? What's he looking for? Someone to devour. He wanted to devour Job, but he couldn't. Why? Because God had a hedge of protection around him. And so he's been out doing his evil deeds, uh, but this is one particular opponent of God. And if we compare this with Revelation 12, it seems that he's a very prominent individual among the angels, because in Revelation 12, 7, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, who we now understand is the Satan and the devil. Uh, and, and so God um, 
uh, uh, the war broke out with, in heaven, but Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So he has angels that follow him. He is prominent in some way. But why is he called the devil? He's called Satan because he's the adversary, but he's called the devil because of his role as the accuser or slanderer of the brethren or, or anyone really that, is, that he opposes, as in Revelation 12.10 where he accuses the brethren day and night. We also see this in one of, there's only a few references to, the, to Satan in the Old Testament. Uh, we've, we've covered two of the major ones. Now this is the third major one. Uh, <clears throat> Zechariah 3, 1 through 5 says, then he showed, now specifically as Satan, he's, he, he appears as the serpent and different things like that. But uh, Zechariah 3, 1 through 5 says, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, and, and to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. So you see what's going on? The, the, the Joshua the high priest is standing in filthy, defiled robes. And the, the, the adversary is standing there. What, what's the point there? What's the implication? He's accusing. He's standing there to accuse the brethren, to, uh, to oppose Joshua. What's God's solution to that? Purifies him, takes those dirty, rotten robes and gives him brand new robes. Guess what? That poor Joshua had to go out and make those robes, didn't he? He had to go out there and toil and labor and, and stitch those robes together and bleach them white so that he could put on his new robes, didn't he? He had to do that? No? Where did those robes come from? God. They were a gift. Your righteousness is not your own. It's a gift from God. Amen. You know, I, I just, I came across this in a, in a video on YouTube this week where uh, uh, this guy's claiming the Protestants, you know, well, he just gets off on this, this issue. But anyways, he, he seems to think that God can't just forgive you and give you righteousness. I thought, well, what does he do with this text? You know? Anyways, I'm, I'm going to have to try to do a response to him, but... Uh, the, the point being that, that Satan stood there to accuse Joshua, but God has a solution, and that was to purify him, give him new robes, give him righteousness uh, that was not his own. But are you beginning to see the connection? Satan and the serpent of old are the same person. Not only that, the serpent slandered God and essentially accused him of lying to Eve. So always a liar and a slanderer, the serpent's tactics continue today with his slanderous accusations against the saints. So that's, I, I think it's clear that, that, you know, we can make those connections. The devil, Satan, uh, the serpent in the garden, they're, they're the same person. Now, where did that serpent come from? Where does dragon come from? Did he, you know, has he always existed? You know, he's very closely associated with the angels. As I said, he leads his angels just as Michael, whom, who himself is an angel, led his angels. Uh, but then we have to ask the question, where do angels come from? Are they eternally existing beings? Are they gods? Uh, is the dragon an evil god that has stood opposed to God throughout eternity, as some dualistic religions would argue? Well, let's see what we can discover from Scripture. First, we know that there are no other gods besides Yahweh, the God of Israel. Amen. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Period. He alone is God. Second, we note that all things, even all spiritual beings, are created by God. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. 
All things were created through him and for him. Obviously, Satan is a created being. Now, notice the hierarchy of spiritual beings in this text. This fits well with what we know so far. Satan, the dragon, leads his angels. He seems to have some authority over them. But where does he fit in that hierarchy? Another question. Was he created to be evil? If he wasn't created to be evil, if God didn't create... Remember, Scripture says that everything that God created was good. He saw it and he said it was good. So, apparently, he wasn't created to be evil. If, well, if he wasn't created to be evil, then how did he become evil? To answer these questions, we need to turn to some controversial text. And there are two important texts that I believe give us a lot of information about Satan. But as I said, they're controversial. Specifically, they're controversial because uh, it's questionable whether they actually refer to the devil or not. We've, we've taken these texts for a long time in evangelical circles as, uh, being, as referring to the devil. They are Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, and Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Uh, now, the reason that they're questionable is because in context, the former seems to be about the king of Tyre and the latter the king of Babylon, rather than being about the devil. So why then are they identified as referring to the devil? Because in their language, they seem to go beyond the merely human. They seem to go beyond just descriptions of a human person. They both seem to point to a spiritual being, i.e. Satan. Now, I'm not going to give a full-on defense of this view at this time. I'm going to assume these two passages do speak of the devil and not try to get into that because Tyler would have been right. We'd have a two-hour sermon. And, and so I'm hoping to do a video on this, this and, and, and go through my reasons why uh, that's the case. I was going to do it this week, but I was burnt out by the time, and then my voice wasn't up for it and stuff. So I'll try to get that video for you because it's very fascinating. Um, but suffice it to say that in Ezekiel 28, 11 through 9, um, you know, we, we see the uh, 11 through 19, we see a, a, a distinct passage. Now, the, the beginning of that chapter begins with the print, uh, uh, an address to the prince of Tyre, and then in 11 it changes to the king of Tyre. And I think what's going on there is that the first is a prophecy to the actual physical human pr uh, uh, prince of Tyre, and the second one then is to the spiritual entity behind the king of Tyre, although it still has application to him. But let's read it and see what you think. Is this a human being? Or is this just a human being? Or is this speaking to something beyond just mere humanity? Verse 11 of Ezekiel 28. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You, corru you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by, mul by the multitudes of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. And all, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall, and shall be no more forever. Now I think that there's some elements in there that speak to a, a, a nation, a city, um, that, that still lies, behind all, uh, lies in front of all this, but I think behind that, God is speaking about the serpent, the dragon, the devil. What, we, we can make several points from this text. That the, the, the devil, the dragon, the, uh, the serpent, 
Satan, our adversary, is a cherub. He's a specific kind of angel, a guardian cherub. Now, Exodus 25, 18 says this, And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about in the tabernacle, the mercy seat with the Ark of the Covenant had two cherubim that guarded each side of this thing. And their wings, you know, touched and stuff. And so they, they guarded the, the, the holy seat, the mercy seat uh, in, in the tabernacle. Now, I think it's interesting that there are only two. Maybe there's something. Why aren't there three? There's three members of the Trinity. Uh, maybe there should have been three at one time. I don't know. But nevertheless, there's only two. Uh, but notice that they are cherubim and they guard the mercy seat. Also, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east, of the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So these cherubs, they guard. They're, and, and this, they're, they're guarding God's throne. They're guarding the way of life. They, 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 they seem to be the four living creatures in Ezekiel. There seems to be some connections there that they're, they're the same thing. Uh, or that you know they are cherubs, or cherubim, the Hebrew plural, and and they the the four living creatures reappear again in Revelation. And they're probably cherubim, and so we don't know how many there are, but apparently, the devil was one of them, and his role was to guard. He was a covering or guardian angel, or cherub. He was created. He, he, doesn't, he hasn't always existed because the scripture says, on the day you were created. Not only was he created, but he was created morally perfect. It says you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. That's the, the, he, he, he behaved or acted in perfection. Now he may, been, have, may have been the most exalted and beautiful of all the angels. We, we don't get that per, you know, statement per se, but... The description is, you are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He sinned. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You're perfect in all your ways till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence and you sinned. So iniquity, iniquity was discovered in him at some point. Evil was born in the heart of the devil, of an angel, a guardian cherub of God. He wasn't the devil at that time. A guardian cherub of God, and evil was born in his heart. And then he was cast out. Therefore I cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. A perfect creature chose to sin. He was not created in sin or with sin. It was found in him. So how could a perfect creature choose that which is imperfect? He did so by the perfection of freedom that was given to him by God. He was perfect in that he had no inward bent towards sin. But he did have the moral capacity to sin by the exercise of a free choice, which he did. But why? Why? What motivated him to sin? If there, if there was nothing evil within him, what possibly could motivate him to sin? Well, we now turn to the fall of the dragon. We've looked at his identity and his nature. Let's look at his fall. From Ezekiel, uh, we see something of the motivation behind his fall. Ezekiel 28, 16 through 17 says, By the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence, and you sinned, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. What was he lacking? Did he, have any, did he lack anything? He wasn't like Adam, missing a wife. He didn't need a wife. He wasn't lacking anything. What did he have? Nothing but blessing. So what could be the source of his temptation? The blessing, all the good that God had given to him, 
It wasn't evil that God put before him. It was good. And the problem was he chose what? A lesser good. He didn't choose the greatest good. And we'll see that. We'll understand that. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. It was those things that led his heart astray. The goodness of God. And he turned it into evil. See, we find out a little more in Isaiah. When we go to Isaiah 14, 12 through, 17, or 12 through 15, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. And there's more that says, you know, but again, there's murkiness there between the king of Babylon and Lucifer. Which we see now, for the first time, a possible name for the serpent before he becomes the serpent, Lucifer. It means day star or morning star or maybe even light bearer. Guess who else bears this name? I once, there was once a, uh, uh, a Christian bookstore called Daystar Books. And people would go in there and say, you're calling yourself the, the bookstore of the devil. Because he's the day star. Well, let me read to you 2 Peter 1.19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do, dwell, do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star or the day star rises in your hearts. Now, is Peter asking for the devil to rise in your hearts? <laughs> no, he's, he wants the, the, the morning star, Jesus. Jesus is also referred to as the day star, the morning star. The bright and morning star. So the point being that Lucifer seems to bear the name of Jesus in some sense. Seems to have a very close relationship to Jesus. You know, there's only three archangels mentioned in the Bible. Or, well, what we assume are archangels. What's the three names if we include, include Lucifer as a, a, an angel, a covering cherub? Michael and who else? Gabriel, that's it, three. Huh, interesting, three. Hmm. And Michael is the war prince of Israel, and Israel is the bride, or the wife, I should say, of the father. It's interesting to me. Gabriel is the spokesperson, seems to be. The, he's always showing up and, and announcing stuff. He seems to be the spokesperson. I, I would say that uh, uh, he might have some particular relationship to the, uh, to the, to the Holy Spirit, and Lucifer, ah, he's named after Jesus, so probably he has some particular relationship to Jesus. You always see him in opposition to Jesus. You always see him opposing him. And so, it's just a weird connection. Maybe I'm reading too much in it. It's okay, let me do that. I like doing that. You don't have to believe me. I, 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 there's no proof text here. That's just all speculation there, but, but I like it. So, anyways. I do believe, though, that Lucifer is the name of the serpent. I believe the connection's there. I believe his uh, intentions are expressed here in the five I wills. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be, most, I'll be like the Most High. See, he wants to be God, and he wants to be worshipped as God. In fact, Luke 4, 5 through 8 says, Then the devil, taking Jesus up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you'll pay me $100, I'll give it to you. Is that what he said? No. A million dollars, a trillion dollars. Is that what he's after? Money? What's he want? Worship. worship. 
If you will worship before me, and he doesn't mean worship God in front of him. He means to bow down and worship him. All will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Jesus knew what he wanted. No, I will only worship the Lord God. He's after worship. You'll understand as we, as we finish this up of why that's the case. Hey, we're making good time here. See, worship is his goal. He wants to receive the glory. Why? Remember what it said about what covered him? What covered him? What, what was he covered in? Jewels. Now, if you take a jewel and you go into a, a room with no windows and you turn off the light, it's just going to blind you, isn't it? It's, it's brilliant dazzle in the darkness. It's just going to shine forth and you're going to use it like a flashlight, right? No, why not? It doesn't have any light in it. It only reflects the light. It has no, it's not a source of light. And so the devil had no light in himself. He is only a giant reflector. He's designed to reflect the light of God. He's covered in all manner of jewels. All to God's glory because it all reflects back to God. So as God shines on him, he sparkles and glows and is beautiful beyond imagination. But what light you're seeing is the light of God. The, the, for the glory of God shines on him. But Lucifer wanted it for himself. And since jewels have no light of their own, they are dependent on an external light. How's he going to shine? Only if we worship him. Only if light is shined upon him. He thinks that if we can worship him, he'll shine. Because he made the mistake of thinking that the, that the worship that people were giving to God, the angels were giving to God, that brought glory and honor to him. See, he was supposed to pass it on. He's supposed to pass the glory to God. And he thought it's coming from him, I guess. Hey, look how wonderful I am. He didn't know that when the light went out, he'd just be nothing. And so, he wants a source of light to be beautiful again. And since no jewels have light of their own, he's got to come and find it. He is dependent upon us. Those who would worship him. That's why I wanted Jesus to worship him. See, it is this desire and the pride that led to it that caused his fall. Instead of being the light bearer, he's the dragon, the adversary, the devil. He went from light to dark. Now, he's still an angel of light in, the sense, in that sense that he can appear. But his light is not his own. He can appear as an angel of light, but it's not his own. Now, Dwight Pentecost sums this study up with these words. He says, did God know that the pride that would captivate the heart of Lucifer when he, did God know the pride that would captivate the heart of Lucifer when he created him? Yes. Since God is omniscient, he knew. Could God have prevented it? Yes, because God is omnipotent, he could have. Why didn't he? No one knows. God has chosen to enter into conflict with the prince of the power of the air so that through his victory over the innumerable host of wickedness, God can demonstrate to all creation that he is a God of glory, a God of holiness, a God of power, a God who is worthy to be worshipped and praised. God didn't force the devil to do it. All he did to him was bless him. Same thing with Pharaoh. God didn't say, I'm going to make you be mean and ornery. He said, I'm going to raise you up. 
because I needed somebody like you. You're mean and honorary, and I'm going to make you the king. I'm going to bless you. And every time he blessed Pharaoh with, with relief, Pharaoh's heart, heart hardened. It was the good that God was doing to them that caused them, not caused them, but led them to sin. It was the good because they chose to use it for evil. What they chose was the lesser good. What was the greatest good that Satan or Lucifer at that time could have done? Reflected the glory of God that come through the praise and worship of the angels. He could have shined like glory and rejoiced in that. But he wanted it for himself. He didn't want God to get it. And so he said, I will be like the Most High. I am going to receive the praise. Well, how do we apply this? Beware of pride. <laughs> I mean, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, in talking about elders, and nominating elders and, and putting them in office, says, uh, don't, don't put an office, a novice in office. Lest being puffed up with, the pride, with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. In other words, when you get all huffy and puffy about who you are, I'm something else. Woohoo! You're just like the devil. You're taking a good a blessing that you have. Maybe you're a fantastic artist like me. <laughs> or a fabulous singer like me. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I don't know what your talent is, but whatever it is, you can set yourself up in pride about it. Maybe you just think you're smart are perceptive about other people and you set yourself up in pride as their judge saying well you know they just don't know how to think right they don't know how to act right they don't know how to do it. whatever it is it doesn't matter when you set yourself up in pride you're just being like the devil pride will do us in it will destroy us and God is very, very serious about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, and lest, and lest I should be exalted above measure, now he's talking about in his heart mostly, but I think among people too, because people tend to exalt, don't they? I mean, oh, our old Apostle Paul, he's something else. He's amazing. And somebody goes, I don't know. He's kind of weak. He's got this problem. We don't know what the problem is, was. Whatever it was, it made Paul kind of detestable, apparently. You know, y'all see the movie Apostle Paul? Anyways, it was out a couple years ago. And they had a, a very, um, a guy that really, you know, to me, like, okay, yeah, he's a, he's a confident-looking guy. You know, somebody might be a leader, that kind of stuff, to play the play Apostle Paul. You know who I think they should have got? How many of y'all seen Princess Bride? And the little nasally guy. The annoying guy. That's who they should have got. Because that's who Paul is. He's not some, you know, uh, leader among men. He's like, huh? This guy is the guy you're all excited about? You know? <laughs> and Paul says, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Not only in his own heart, but by other people, because guess what? When other people start exalting you, what happens to the heart? It used to be so hard, you know, if you get up here and preach and you have a good sermon every once in a while and somebody comes up and says, man, that was a good sermon. I used to have the biggest struggle to respond to that. And then I figured out, you just say thank you. You know, it's just, okay, thank you. I'm glad you were blessed. You know, because that didn't come, that's God's word. 
And, and so when, when people praise you, say thank you. It's okay to be praised. But lest you be exalted above measure, be careful, because God is serious about not letting you get prideful. So serious that he sent the devil to take care of Paul. You don't want no part of that. Dr. Geisler said that when he was alive that he got introduced as the greatest living Christian apologist. He said, Do you, can you imagine the temptation to believe that? Yeah. yeah. In fact, he told a story. <laughs> I'll never forget the story. He told a story about a professor. And he says, the most humble guy you ever met in your life. And, and I mean, he would apologize three times if in, in the hallway for getting in your way, you know. And, and, and just a very humble guy. And, and his students uh, uh, in, the, in the seminary that year all voted that he was the most humble professor. So they made a plaque. <laughs> most humble professor and gave it to him. And he's like, what do you do with that? You can't hang it on the wall. <laughs> You hide in the drawer, you know. You start believing it. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that brings us to the second point. Not, not only beware of pride, but get this. It's almost an oxymoron, a conundrum. Seek exaltation. Say, what? Notice the second part of Jesus' statement there. Whoever humbles himself will be humbled. I mean, whoever exalts, him, exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be what? Humbled? No. Exalted. Huh? You mean I'm supposed to seek exaltation? Yes. You are. For the right reasons and, the right, and in the right way. We are made to reflect God's glory. And the degree to which we achieve the reward of service to God, to the degree that we um, you know, live our lives for Him, that is the degree to which we are going to reflect the glory of God. We are to seek exaltation because it isn't our exaltation that we'll get. It's God's exaltation we will properly reflect His glory and His praise and His worship. The light will not be ours, but we'll shine bright. And the more you serve Him, the more you walk with Him, the more you know Him, the brighter you're going to shine. Because it's His glory reflected back to Him. And He's doing a work in you to cause you to shine. But you're not going to shine very much if you don't listen to what he's doing or, or work with him or yield to him. You might be saved and you might be, you know, a glow light <laughs> and other people will be a spotlight. There is a degree of exaltation that we should seek, but we should seek it for the right reasons, not our own glory, not our own light, but for the glory and light of God. Matthew 13, 43 says, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Beware of pride, but seek exaltation in Christ through humility. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for your word that does tell us that you created the devil, well, Lucifer at that time. You gave him all good things. You didn't create him evil. Uh, you gave him the good, op the good perfection of uh, freedom in which he chose, not evil, but a lesser good. He chose his own glory and his own splendor, all things that are good, over your glory and over your splendor. And in so doing, Lord, he privated the good that ought to be, which was your glory. And he, he sought for the lesser good, which is his glory. And it wrought ruin and destruction upon him and Lord we know that we have done that many times we think that we're seeking our own good oh we just just need that you know next alco bit of alcohol or next drug or next illicit relationship just to make us feel good 
because we're after that good, that feeling of good. And Lord, we, you know it's a lie. And it will ruin us and bring destruction, just like Satan's pursuit of his own good brought destruction to him. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to see that pursuing our own good will never, ever end well. But when we pursue your glory, when we pursue, when we pursue your glory, Lord, when we pursue uh, reflecting you and honoring you and giving grace, I mean, uh, praise and honor to you, Lord, through your grace, then it will redound to our good and we will be exalted in your presence, Lord, reflecting who you are, enjoying that glory that you give to us, Lord. But it only comes through the way of humility as we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge, God, that we are simply jewels without light until you shine upon us. And I pray that we would live that out the rest of this week, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.